audiobook. Simply this moment. For looking for the sweet chili. Seeking happiness in the world. 1st of March 2000. When we stay in a monastery to practice meditation, there's a great development of mindfulness which is drawn inside instead of being directed only to the world outside. So the ideal of monastic life includes that part of meditation which we call introspection. We get in touch with ourself and how we feel. We look at what makes us tick. In particular, one starts to get in contact with the happiness and suffering of life. Coming to a monastery, one is very often seeking meaning, seeking wisdom, seeking happiness. And indeed, those quests for meaning, for wisdom, for happiness, are quests that we can see all over the world, amongst all people. Even the animals and beings of other realms are seeking happiness and meaning, and they are all running away from suffering. If one can give life a description, it is just the pursuit of happiness and the running away from pain and suffering. However, although it is the case that people and all beings in Cicero pursue that happiness, they very rarely find it. They seek pleasure and happiness but they just encounter suffering. This is the truth of life which I have come up against again and again, both in my own life and in the lives of the people I have met, spoken with, and spent time with. We see that the whole world is just seeking happiness, seeking pleasure, and very rarely finding it. Very often the pleasure that people seek is an empty pleasure, a false pleasure. We're like sheep following each another. When all the sheep commonly agree that this is pleasure, everyone goes along with it. No one ever calls the bluff. No one investigates what they feel. Last night coming back from giving a dammit talk in Armadale, we had to stop to fill up with petrol at the service station. Next to us was a group of young men and women, maybe 18, 19 or 20 years old, just cruising as the saying goes. With nothing much to do in the evening they were just acting silly, like a bunch of idiots. Even though to me what they were talking about and how they were Cavorting looked crazy and stupid, to them it was supposed to be cool. They thought it was happy and pleasurable. I think it was commonly agreed that that was the thing to do and so no one ever questioned whether what they were doing was happiness or not. I recall that in my life I have always asked questions. Questioning and probing leads to real happiness. Questioning and investigating what this life is all about. Questioning what pleasure is. Is this real pleasure? What's life all about anyway? This was something that led me to a monastic life, led me to meditation, and led me to where I am now. I've sometimes given talks where I've summed up the Buddha's teaching of the Four Noble Truths into two truths, what is real happiness, and how do I get it? These are basically the two questions that propel human beings and animals through life. Finding out what happiness is and how we can secure it for ourselves? Is this it? The first thing I want to point out here is that you cannot always believe what other people say is happiness. I trod that path in my early years. People said that happiness was the rock bands and the drugs. They said happiness was sex and travel. I've been there and done that and to me it wasn't happiness at all. When we are doing all those things we are always just waiting for something to happen. Where is this happiness that people have promised? Is there something wrong with me? Am I not doing it right? There was some happiness, but just for a moment maybe. At the same time, there was a lot of tension from sex and relationships. Getting drunk was supposed to be so much fun and so great. And, talking about drugs, where was the real pleasure or meaning in that? But at least I had a mind that would question. I could look back afterwards and say, this is stupid, this is meaningless. What am I doing this for? Where is it getting me? Am I really satisfying anything here?
I'm just as lost afterwards as I was before. Whenever I followed any of those pleasures in the world I found that there was always this craving, this hunger and thirst. There was a real fever beforehand and then emptiness afterwards. Is that it? So what? So, is this it? Became a motto for my life in the lay world. Working all those years to get a degree and that's all it is. So what? What have I worked so hard all of these years for? Is this it? Getting into relationships, is that it? So what? Listening to fine music, is this it? So what? As soon as the music ended there was a hole and that hole was caused by craving, we just fill in something temporarily. It was like plastering over a crack in the wall, and as soon as the plaster dries the crack, reappears. We aren't really solving the problem, we are just plastering it over. Temporarily. Certainly in my life, due to the search for pleasure, the search for meaning, the search for some sort of happiness, I started to really doubt and question the world out there. I questioned the lay life. At least I had some inspiration, I don't know where from, almost certainly from a past life. I suppose. My inspiration was to try and look for that peace and happiness in the monastic life. When I saw Buddhist monks they seemed to be the most peaceful, the happiest and the most together people I'd ever seen. This shocked me a little, because the first thing I had read about Buddhism was the teaching of the Four Noble Truths, which is all about suffering. I couldn't understand why it was that these monks, I'm talking. As a lay person, seeing my first monks, were talking about suffering and about giving up things, but they were the happiest people I had ever seen. Their smiles and their serenity was something that made me question my previous lifestyle. When those monks talked about suffering, they were always smiling and that really intrigued me. What was going on? Later on when I started to meditate, I had a powerful and deep experience of happiness, and that was even more intriguing. Why? Was it that in the search for happiness in the world, with its many different possibilities of happiness, the one which seemed to work the most, the one which seemed to be the most profound and long-lasting, the one which seemed to be the most pure, was experienced in deep meditation during a retreat as a lay person? That experience really made me consider what these four noble truths were all about. Later when I became a monk I began to explain the four noble truths in a slightly different way, still true to the original teachings but in a way that was a little bit easier for the lay community to understand. I started to talk about the four noble truths as being the noble truth of happiness, the cause of happiness, the cessation of unhappiness and the way leading to happiness. I likened happiness with the end of suffering and the way leading to happiness with the Eightfold Path. It was true to the original teachings, but it was just explained from a slightly different angle. Certainly to me that made so much sense, because the years that I spent as a young monk, which are supposed to be years of hardship, were in fact years of great fulfillment, of great happiness and great peace. Even having to eat frogs in Thailand, I was a happy monk. I was peaceful and I enjoyed the lifestyle. Now 25 years on I can look back and understand why there was that enjoyment. That enjoyment was caused by letting go. It is the enjoyment that is caused by ending things. It is the happiness of peace. I found out certainly for myself, that what we really know as true happiness, true contentment, has to be peacefulness, it is where things end. It is where movement is stilled and the problems are gone, this is true happiness. Knowing that, we find out that there is a path to true happiness. It's the path of stillness. It is the path of letting go. It is the path of giving up attachments giving up craving. Some people think that they can't give up attachments, 
and they can't give up craving. Basically it's not up to you, if you give it time, it has to happen. It's only a matter of giving causes and effects the time to work. It's no more possible than a flower. Deciding not to bloom, or deciding when it will bloom. The flower just blooms. According to its season and that's all there is to it. In the same way a person starts to engage in the path of letting go, of going against craving and going against attachments. When we are on a happy path, it's always a sign that we're beginning to understanding some dhamma, some teachings, some truths. It's a sign that we are putting that understanding into practice because it's giving us greater happiness, greater peace, greater contentment. Somewhere in this world, somewhere in this life, you're going to have to find some contentment. Otherwise you're going to be running around as if you are being chased by a swarm of bees that are stinging you. Never being able to escape the pressure of suffering in life, one has to find some place where there's contentment, where there's peace, where there's freedom from the struggle. Sometimes when we talk about freedom people don't understand what that word means. It's not freedom to follow defilements craving and attachments. That's what people in the world call freedom. The freedom to cruise around, get drunk and to do drugs or whatever. That sort of freedom is not freedom at all because it is just giving in to coarse desires which never lead to anything fulfilling, useful or happy. People have seen that in the world and they've seen that in others. Surely they should be able to see that in themselves. Those things only lead to more suffering, more entanglement, and more problems. Real freedom is the freedom to say no. The freedom to say no to the forces in the mind that stop one being peaceful, the forces in the mind that keep blowing you from place to place, from person to person. Instead of being blown around in this world, there has to come a time, there has to be a place, there has to be a spot, where one stands still like a mountain. Although the wind blows, you don't move. The wind can blow and blow, but you don't move and eventually the wind gives up. That symbol of a mountain is the symbol of an era and who has let go of moving according to the cravings and the defilements. We have to decide to stand still, just to be here, and not move from the present moment. Views and Ideas People sometimes have the idea that happiness and pleasure is achieved by just following the idiocy of the world. What people in the world say is happiness, the enlightened ones say is suffering. What the enlightened ones say is happiness, the world says is suffering. What is it that people in the world say is happiness? If you read the magazines or the newspapers, you can see that people say happiness is the new movie, the new relationship, going here, going there, and having children and so on. You haven't lived until you've been up the Amazon. Dash or whatever people may say is happiness in the world. I've explored many places and experienced many things in my life, and somehow they all seem so empty and meaningless. I can't Imagine why people still run after those things, why they haven't seen the suffering and the pain of travel, of sex, and of relationships. In Buddhism there is the simile of the horse. There was a wise horse, a smart horse, a heedless horse, a stupid horse and a very, very stupid horse, and there is also the trainer with a whip. The wise horse doesn't even need to see the whip, the trainer tells him to do something, and the horse does it straight away. The horse knows that is in its best interest. That's the path to happiness. Sometimes the trainer has to pick up the whip and let the shadow of it fall on the horse. The shadow of the whip falls on the horse and the smart horse knows, I'd better do the right thing or it's going to hurt. The next horse, being heedless, has to be tapped lightly just a little bit of suffering, just a tap, and it's enough for the horse to know what's in its interest, what 
The path to happiness is. The next horse is stupid and the trainer has to whack it once. Ow! It hurts once, and when it hurts once, that's enough, the horse knows which. Way to go. Of course the very, very stupid horse is the horse that has to be hit again. And again, ow! 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 It still keeps doing the same stupid things, ow! 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 The foolish horse wonders what's going on, but it's amazing how many people, even in a monastery, fall into that last category. Haven't you suffered enough already? What are you doing this for? It's easy to be happy, just stop doing anything, be peaceful and go against the stream. Sometimes it's just habit that holds us back. The horse is so set in its ways, especially in its ways of thinking, that it's hard to change. The horse thinks that next time the whip won't hit him or he will be able to escape. Next time he will be able to outsmart the trainer. But of course, ow! 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 It happens again. The mullen as Rudin was eating a bunch of chilies, eating one after the other, until his face was red, his eyes were streaming, and his nose was running. That is what happens when you eat too many hot chilies. He was still munching those chilies. When someone came up and asked him, Why are you eating so many hot chilies? Mullen Asrudin said I'm looking for the sweet one. This is what people do in life. Whether it's a relationship, a place, or a job, even some monks looking for a monastery, they're still looking for the sweet one. Of course, there is no sweet one. Chilies are chilies, they are all hot, and it's a waste of time to keep eating, eating. Looking for the sweet one in life. This is something that you have to experience for yourself. If you're smart you don't need to be hit many times. But it's more than just realizing suffering, it's also realizing the opposite of suffering, which is recognizing happiness. If one just focuses on the suffering of life, that is not enough of an incentive for people to do what's necessary to find liberation from suffering. We often get used to our suffering, we take it for granted and we think that's all there is. We become accepting of the suffering in the world. We have a story in Buddhism of the worm in a pile of dung. Being so attached to that pile of dung, the worm thinks it's in heaven. This is the trouble with people and suffering, they have some suffering and they get used to it. They then think that suffering is heaven. Coming to a place like this, to the monastic life, we have an opportunity to see something else, something deeper, something more. We have the opportunity to see real happiness. Not some happiness which is promised when you die, not some happiness which is somehow in a distant future. If you make good karma, then you'll be happy. Just believe me and then you'll be okay. The happiness that you can experience in monastic life is the happiness, which is Sandy Hika, available in this very life. It's right in this moment if you care to look at it. One of the things that I find in my meditation is that in any moment we can get to that peace. All we need to do is flick the right switch in our mind. It's a momentary attainment. All we need to do is find that letting go switch. Once we know that switch, that movement of the mind, whether it's our meditation or when we're eating our meal, or whatever else we may be doing, it becomes so easy, so peaceful. That is because we've found the third noble truth, the letting go of suffering. Once we get to that point it's so easy to repeat it and just let go. It's the simplest thing to do once we know how to do it. It's like riding a bike. Once we've learned to ride a bike it's the simplest thing in the world. We don't need to think about it. When we first get onto a bike we wobble all over the place. I think many of you can understand, or at least appreciate, what I am saying. The path to real happiness, the path to the ending of suffering is the ability just to open up, to let go and be free from 
craving. The whole monastery here is shouting out to us to let go and renounce. That's the meaning of this monastery. Oh what bliss! Last night, I was talking to the lay people in Armadale about the conception of emptiness. Emptiness is another word for letting go. If we let go of things we are left with this beautiful, awesome emptiness. Because emptiness is something that is so profound, people often don't realize what it is, so they miss it. They can't see it. People have got a blind spot to emptiness. That's why in the Kula Sada Sada, Amen. 121, the Buddha explains the way to develop the perception to recognize what the mind is free from. Recognize that in the monastery this evening we are free from so many burdens. We're free from television, free from relationships. We're free from bills. We're free from having to go to work. We're free from all the bitterness that can so easily oppress us in life. In one particular sada the Buddha encouraged the monks to bring up the perception of what we're free from, because that gives us a sense of happiness, the happiness born of freedom. Aho Sagha. Aho Sagha. Aho Sagha. A monk said this as he sat under a tree. He was an ex-king, and the other monks thought he was remembering his life as a king with all the sensory pleasures he then had. When they asked him afterwards if that was the case, he said, No, no, I was saying aho. Sagha. Oh what bliss! Oh what bliss! Because now I am free from all of that, free from the concerns, the worries and the bitterness of being a king. Oh what! Happiness, oh what bliss! This is what I encourage you to do in your meditation. Remember what you've left behind. Oh what bliss, oh what bliss, to be free of the streets. Oh what bliss, oh what bliss, to be free of the workplace. Oh what bliss, to be free from the pressures of relationships. Oh what bliss, oh what bliss, to be free from concerns about money, and acquiring possessions. In a monastery such as this you are free from so many things. Even if you're just here. For a few hours or days you're free from many burdens, and the mind dwells upon the perception of what you've let go. This is dwelling on the third noble truth. This is dwelling on cessation, ending and emptiness. This is dwelling on Nibbana itself or, at least, it is leaning in that direction. When you cultivate the perception of the third noble truth in this way, it points out to you what this happiness in monastic life really is. If we forget that perception of emptiness, we just don't see it and we think there is nothing there. There is a big difference between nothing and emptiness. Nothing is something you can't see, emptiness is something you can really appreciate. Once we start to develop these sorts of perceptions we say, hey, this is real happiness. This is real peace. This is real contentment. This is really fulfilling. We are noticing the happiness of things ending, not the happiness of things beginning. We're noticing the happiness of having nothing to do, rather than looking for something to do. We're noticing the happiness of space rather than the happiness of things. As we begin to focus on the perceptions of emptiness, we're finding out what real happiness is. The more we empty out, the more happiness we feel. We can empty our mind of thought and see how peaceful, wonderful and blissful it is if our mind is not obsessed or tyrannized by this one thing, which we call thinking. This one thing, which we call thinking. This one thing, which we call thinking. This 